coming up on In the Life. Politics 96. Are gay issues in or out of the closet? Exotic comedian Marga Gomez hits the boards with her one-woman show at the public. And political humorist Kate Clinton pays a visit to the gay first family of Washington. All up next on In the Life, America's information line on lesbian and gay issues and culture. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Lily Ockenkloss, the Gill Foundation, James C. Hormel, Eldon W. Tamblin, Olive Watson, and In the Life's National Membership Network. In the... Welcome to In the Life and the 1996 Contest to Live Here, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Hello, I'm Katherine Linton. As recently as eight years ago, gay and lesbian issues were almost entirely invisible on the campaign trail. But in 1992, that reality changed dramatically. From the GOP National Convention, where Pat Buchanan made his anti-gay remarks, to the New York Democratic Convention, where Bill Clinton was the first ever presidential nominee to address AIDS and speak the word gay. This is America. There is no them. There is only us. For better or for worse, gay and lesbian issues had arrived. In this episode, we'll examine to what extent these issues have remained in the political spotlight and whether or not they'll be as important in the upcoming elections as they were in 1992. In 1992, after years of organizing in electoral politics, lesbian and gay issues finally made it into the presidential campaign. I think we have to fight oppression, whether it's against blacks or gays or lesbians. We're also going to put AIDS on the national agenda once and for all. This election is critical for us. We as the Human Rights Campaign Fund, as a leading political force in this country, have for the very first time endorsed a presidential candidate in this election. We must realize that we have to establish a gay and lesbian vote. We have endorsed Bill Clinton. He made it very clear in his campaign that he would sign a gay and lesbian civil rights act. He also promised a war on AIDS. The AIDS Commission has issued two excellent reports that should be eagerly embraced by the president. And he promised to lift the ban on lesbians and gays in the military. There will be an executive order and 50 years of government persecution and witch hunts will be over with the signature of Bill Clinton on that order. So here we are bringing queer issues to the campaign right here, right now in a dress. I think 1992 was an extraordinary time. It became sort of the gay 90s, whether we liked it or not. Bob Hattoy spoke at the 1992 Democratic National Convention as an openly gay man with AIDS. Bill Clinton at the time said that he had a vision for America and that we were part of it. And I think that somehow, you know, played a chord within the gay and lesbian community where we, in unprecedented numbers, became part of community organizations, neighborhood headquarters, activist or, um, groups, and we worked hard to get Bill Clinton elected. So celebrate tonight. This is your victory. You earned it. You worked for it. You paid for it. And you damn well deserve it. I think it's still extraordinary times for us. In 1992, it was based on an outpouring of positive energy where people felt empowered, they felt worthy, they felt embraced. And I think 1996 forces are based on a darker side of America. We're very conscious that we haven't gone away as a scapegoat issue for conservatives in this country. Earlier this year, just before the presidential caucuses in Iowa, right-wing groups held a rally to protest same-gender marriages. The presidential candidates are being asked to pledge to stand up for the sanctity of same-sex 
against same-sex marriages and for a marriage based on men and women because our very culture depends on it. Nearly all the candidates agreed to sign the resolution. Although same-gender marriage has not been a prominent campaign issue, the right wing is using it to raise money and mobilize support. It's not a presidential issue, it's not a campaign issue, um, but it is for the right wing a mobilizing issue because it raises all the fears about the death, the death of the family, etc., etc., etc. And if we accept the homosexual agenda, which seeks recognition for homosexual marriages, we will be destroying the integrity of the marriage-based family, and that view will destroy family life, the child, the innocence of childhood, and indeed the very fabric of our society. It is the family that is the bedrock institution of society. And if that family crumbles and cracks and breaks, then the whole structure of society will break and your nation will fall. If we don't put families first in America again, we're going to lose our country, and I intend to put families first in America again. There are people that are running Congress right now who hate us, and it's hard to say that unless you observe it on a day-to-day -day level. There are the people who really, if their legislative proposals on Medicare cutbacks or on um, choice, will kill us. They will kill us because there won't be funding for um, you know, adequate and healthy abortions. There won't be funding for AIDS. There won't be funding for health care. So I think um, it's a life and death election for us this year. In the Life traveled to New Hampshire for the first primary to see how lesbian and gay issues would play out. We spoke with Randy Kotwitz, a local gay activist. As I see my role in this election, it's not so much about working for any particular candidate, uh, because in the end, it's going to be Clinton as the Democratic nominee. So I don't think it's going to be so much a matter of candidate as it is going to be a matter of issues. And I have more or less given up my life right now to fighting the religious right. Randy got his training for the presidential campaign last year when the Merrimack School Board tried to pass a conservative agenda. My partner and I had already been involved in working on pro-education issues when the Christian right had tried to put creationism into the science curriculum. Therefore, when the inevitable pointer turned to an anti-gay issue, we already knew the people that we needed to work with. They already knew us as a loving, wholesome, gay couple. And they turned to us for information right away. Having learned the value of strong political coalitions, Randy joined up with People for the American Way and their Expose the Right campaign which used the primary to publicize the right-wing positions of Republican candidates. We need to find every opportunity that we can to express ourselves and to mobilize and organize progressive people. Uh, Expose the Right uh, did that in Iowa. It's doing that now in New Hampshire during this presidential campaign. Protect the Bill of Rights. Expose the religious right. I mean, I think this country desperately needs to hear these voices articulated, clearly and without apology. Um, standing up and saying we're going to do the right thing and we're going to fight for what we believe in because we're fighting for our, our families, for our children, for our future, for what America is at its best. If we can say that and do that and translate that in the, in, into the 1996 election cycle, uh, we'll, be, we'll do more than just win seats back in 1996. We will have helped to transform the political climate in this country. You know, I'm especially grateful at how many members of the gay and lesbian community have come out tonight, and I think it's especially no noticeable how many gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered youth are here to join us tonight. One of the things that I like to appeal to gay people about is that when you fight any part of the religious right agenda, you're fighting the whole agenda. And so if you fight the religious right on an education issue in your local school board election, you are still fighting the same people, the same enemy, and the same issue on a national basis. Go, Pat, go! 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 Steve Michael was also fighting for his life in New Hampshire. He ran in the Democratic primary as a way to focus national attention on AIDS. What we're trying to do with uh, AIDS Vote 96 is to focus all the candidates' attention on AIDS, get their positions on AIDS, but also educate them as to what needs to be done. This could be the last presidential election for a lot of us. It will be for me. 
Getting on the ballot allowed Aids Vote 96 to run campaign ads at lower than commercial rates. And they used this opportunity to run candid spots on AIDS education. We're trying to up the ante and show what needs to be done in prevention ads and actually educate people about HIV at the same time. In 1992, ACT UP protested 12 years of Republican neglect. This year, Steve Michael is using the campaign to put pressure on the Democratic administration. It's very easy for Bill Clinton to talk about AIDS at a fundraiser in New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles. But what leadership on AIDS means is talking about AIDS here in New Hampshire. AIDS deaths increased in New Hampshire by 64% last year. That's what leadership is. Our mere presence in this state, participating in the Democratic caucuses, running Steve as a candidate for president, has made AIDS an issue. We have to make AIDS the frontline issue in the war. And that's what we're going to do, and we're going to keep going until all of us are dead or until there's a cure. Steve Michael's plan is to bring his protest to the Democratic National Convention this August, and lesbian and gay activists will definitely be present when the Republicans convene to pick their candidate. For the November elections, lesbians and gay men are planning new strategies like Promote the Vote, which will not only register voters, but will also get them to the voting booth. The single most motivating factor in our decision to, to, to expand voter registration to voter mobilization has to do with looking at the fact that 60% of the people that are eligible to vote are registered. A third of the ones that are registered don't vote. So we feel very strongly that it's not enough to simply register voters. We have to find ways of motivating them and then of actually getting them to go to the polls. Promote the Vote will be carried out using a national network of gay and lesbian community centers. Uh, Richard Burns, our director, is fond of saying community centers, centers are the engines of lesbian gay liberation. It's only recently that a project like this is even possible. Just last year, in November of 1995, a national association of community centers was formed. And as this network grows, and it wills, I mean, in, in the last five years alone, more than 20 centers have been established around the country. This is the, the, the local grassroots infrastructure that we've been talking about and dreaming about and hoping for for many, many, many years. It actually exists. While the debate over political strategies in the presidential campaign rages on, another crucial debate in the lesbian and gay community is over how and why we choose candidates for political office. Correspondent Alan Tulin reports. Certainly gays and lesbians have become much more involved in the political process and are exercising their power through the use of votes and money. A question being raised, however, is one that's often faced by other minority communities, and it's this. Should gay or lesbian candidates win gay votes and financial support simply based on their sexual orientation, or are candidates best judged only on the issues? In other words, is being gay or lesbian an important political consideration? I know from my own experience here in New York City that having a seat at the table makes all the difference in the world. One person with a seat at that table is New York City Councilman Tom Duane. He's one of only 115 openly gay elected officials in the U.S. who believes it's very important for gay people to serve the public. But we can't really always depend on other people to fight our battles because when uh, they are provided with a whole host of choices of things to fight on, they may not always choose uh, a battle that's very important to the lesbian and gay community. I decided to run for Congress in April of this year because I was deeply concerned about the direction that the Republican Congress is taking this country. Rick Zburr, candidate from Long Beach, California, hopes to be judged primarily on the issues. There, there's going to be a group of people in the electorate that will um, vote against me because I am an openly gay man. But it's going to be the same group of people that votes against me because I'm pro-choice and because I'm a Democrat. And our voting actually showed that it's a bigger negative in the minds of voters in my congressional district that I'm an attorney than that I'm a, a gay person. Zburr, along with other gay and lesbian candidates running for office this fall, often rely on the support of gay and lesbian political action committees. One organization, the Victory Fund, only supports non-incumbent candidates who are openly gay or lesbian. Those are the only candidates that can really 
represent us as a community. So our mission is very simple. We have very stringent criteria at the Victory Fund. You have to run as an openly gay candidate. But in addition to that, you have to endorse a federal gay and rights bill, and you have to endorse them on the local level. You have to be very strong on health care issues for the gay community, for, against AIDS discrimination. You have to be strong on uh, breast cancer issues, and you have to be pro-choice. But most importantly, and people don't realize this, you have to be a viable candidate. You can't just be openly gay and lesbian. You have to be viable. Other political action committees, like the Human Rights Campaign and the Empire State Pride Agenda in New York State, do not require their candidates to be homosexual, a fact which makes supporting them more complicated. It really becomes a problem when an open lesbian or gay person runs against someone with a strong track record who's been in office uh, supporting lesbian and gay issues. And you really have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. The way things work in politics is you have to, in order to have credibility, uh, be able to stand by your friends when they need you. Uh, my ability is severely weakened when I go to Albany and try and lobby uh, non-gay legislators to support a piece of legislation um, and then not be able to back them when they come to us for support. Our job is to elect a pro-gay Congress and a pro-gay president. What we look at is a matrix. We look at a variety of issues, uh, but voting record is one of the most important. If you have someone who has been absolutely loyal and they are not gay, but they have a 100% voting record, they have done everything the gay community has asked them to do, we, we are loyal uh, to that incumbent candidate. But for many voters, there is the belief that placing openly gay people in office does have political impact. I have great respect for all three of the openly gay congressmen in Washington at present. Um, one of the reasons that I'm here tonight is because two of those members will be retiring at the end of the congressional session. And I think it's important to get new members elected. From my perspective as a, as a straight elected official, it's important that we elect people who are uh, sympathetic to, uh, to issues involving human values, uh, social services, and I think in many cases gay and lesbian candidates uh, have an affinity for people who are disadvantaged, and therefore we're able to build a, a common political agenda that goes beyond uh, the gay and lesbian agenda. For me, there is no choice between, and, and I'm going to emphasize this, a qualified openly gay or lesbian candidate and a very pro-gay candidate. We must have representation. That's what this country is built on. And a pro-gay uh, candidate does not represent us. They try to help us, but they can't represent us. And remember, we have over a half a million elected officials in this country. We should have if we were being represented, we should have, say, 10% would be 50,000 openly gay and lesbian people. We have somewhat over 100. So we got a lot of work to do. As more openly gay candidates run for office, all voters, gay or straight, may soon be given the option to cast a vote for a gay or lesbian representative. For In the Life, this is Alan Tulin. to a Cuban comedian and a Puerto Rican exotic dancer, Margot Gomez thinks of herself as a hybrid of the two, an exotic comedian. Best known in the gay and lesbian community for her stand-up routines about sexuality and politics, Margot is now giving her humor a dramatic edge here in New York at the Public Theater with her play, A Line Around the Block. The work you, you do, what would that be? I spoke to Margot and her director, Corey Madden, in between rehearsals. Margot wrote her one-woman show, A Line Around the Block, as a tribute to her father. My dad was uh, an empresario. He was a, a comedian, but, he, but I really think uh, how I exper experienced him was as a showman, putting on these mega variety shows where uh, everybody... Uh, uh, from, from the neighborhood back in, uh, you know, back in the 60s, when people you know, we're more hopeful and optimistic about uh, coming to New York from Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic. And it was, it was a sense of community. To, it wasn't just going to a show. It was also to be with everybody. 
At the height of his success, Marga's father was the spokesperson for the popular coffee, Café El Pico. A lady is pushing a baby carriage. She's pushing the baby carriage. You don't see the baby. She's talking to the baby. A goo goo ga ga, baby talk. She says, here, have some milk, baby. Cut to the baby is me in a baby dress. <laughs> I taste the milk. I see that it's not Café El Pico. I say, As I grew up and, uh, you know, my parents split up and I started, like, living in the real mainstream world, um, you know, I sort of lost that charm of what my parents had created in, in show business. And um, I always longed for it. You know, I'm very nostalgic. I tend to live in the past a bit. So uh, I just, I wanted to write their stories down. One of these stories involves Latina star really? Irma Pagan. That's right. I'm Irma Pagan, not... Irma again. But tonight, outside the teatro on the marquee, that's what it says. Irma again. Come see her. Irma <laughs> again. En persona. I don't care what it said yesterday. Today, it needs a P. P, 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 P. And not a little P, okay? A big P. Only then can I perform. I have um, Come in. identified myself as half Cuban and half lesbian. Uh, many times, and of course, people are always, you know, really surprised sometimes. You know, when I come out there in the low-cut dress and the and the bouffant, they go, "Wow, she doesn't look Cuban." <laughs> I'm so tense tonight. I don't know why, but I am muy, muy, muy tense, and I'll require a full body massage before I go on. And this time, Leonela, make it hard. This show is sort of like a, in a way, it's really old-fashioned. It's an old-fashioned story told by a queer. Queer girl. <laughs> <laughs> Though her current stage work is getting a lot of attention, Marga is probably best known for her stand-up comedy, which she's been doing since the early 80s. I have a paper towel disorder. I, I waste them. Uh, I can't help it. It's not an accident. I mean to do it. And Susie thinks I should use both sides of the paper towel. <laughs> and then uh, dry it out. <laughs> Make it into a decoration. <laughs> or maybe a mantilla. I asked Marga how her comedy club fans feel about her venturing into theater. Well, um, I think, you know, the people that are, are really my, my following, my, my hardcore following, um, there's been no problem. Some people who wouldn't go see me because they're, for some reason, hate stand-up comedy. Uh, maybe they've been ridiculed. I don't know. They came to this show because they realized it was a, a theater piece. I think that, that there's a tremendous amount of energy coming out of um, the, you know, the gay comedy world, the performance art world, into um, mainstream theaters. And that is sort of where the new energy is coming in terms of writing. So I think it's got a real, it is a crossover event. More than just a crossover success, Marga's work also carries a message. I think if there was uh, just one thing I, I want to say to people with my volumes of work, it would be walk like a lady and eat like a man. <laughs> Washington, D.C. Politics, power, persuasion, and sometimes paranoia. Perhaps nowhere is the closet more pervasive than in national politics. And a quick tally of openly gay participants of the three branches of government reveals a very short list. But what about the so-called fourth branch of government, the press? We talked to journalists from print, radio, and television at a recent NLGJA conference in Washington, D.C. While all agreed that news coverage of gay issues has increased over the last five years, they also noted that much progress still needs to be made. Yes, I found an NLGJA five years ago, right after doing a national survey for the newspaper industry, very first national survey of gays and lesbians in the news business. And what we found out was that there are 
95% of them were closeted, uh, living very fearful lives, standing by while stereotypes and caricatures about gays were being published in their institutions. So there's a real concern. I happen to believe, personally, when you're in a profession in which your goal is to seek and disseminate the truth, the most important thing is that you're truthful about yourself. Otherwise, I think it's intrinsically hypocritical. On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you're working in a market, a small, very conservative market, a conservative newspaper, an openly homophobic management, yes, then you're talking about a question of self-preservation. And I don't believe in committing professional suicide. At the New York Times, for example, where I work, there are, I would say, approximately 60 gay men or lesbians at the Times. Um, this is in a staff of 4,000 people. When you think of 60 people at once, you think, oh, there are a great many homosexuals. But that is less than 2% of the entire staff. In 1992, Deb Price became America's first openly gay syndicated columnist. Her 1995 book, And Say Hi to Joyce, is a collection of the first 18 months of her award-winning column. I see a lot of bias in gay and lesbian stories in the mainstream media. It's straight bias, and usually it's total ignorance. And I think what we need to do is see this as a major evolving civil rights movement, find the best person to do that job, whether that person is gay or straight, and assign them to do it. It needs to be a beat. In my situation, uh, being an editorial writer, actually being out on the editorial board is an asset. Some people would get upset at being viewed as, oh, well, I guess I'm the expert on gay issues. But I, that, that's a moniker and a title that I actually enjoy having. And I think that in the same way that if you have someone who comes into a newsroom who has a law degree or has a medical degree or who has been in the service, uh, we draw on those people um, that, that life knowledge uh, as something that is of value to the newsroom. It's easier to work at NPR now. Certainly there are a great many more people who are there, still not many gay people on the air, not many people who would identify themselves as such anyway. Frank Browning has reported for National Public Radio for 13 years. He's written two books about the gay experience in America, The Culture of Desire, and his newest book due out this spring, Queer Geography. We know that whether it's NPR or NBC, the market is presumed by the producer to be primarily white, primarily household incomes of over sixty or seventy thousand dollars, and primarily heterosexual, whatever that word means. When you play with that, you disturb people's presumptions and you make editors very upset and they don't know why. The news business right now is, is desperately uh, trying to evolve from a business that has been written by and for straight white men. And there's a way to keep that presence there, but for there to be inclusion as well. I'm disturbing the frame of normalcy. Perhaps most controversial of all is the frame that is the television set. I think the broadcast news industry, and I don't know why, but I just from what I see, I think the broadcast news industry is behind the newspaper industry in terms of journalists themselves who are out in their newsrooms and also in terms of coverage. For a newspaper reporter, it's different. If you look at a newspaper page, there's 10 or 12 bylines on the front page. But on a newscast, there's usually one guy and one gal, and they are the newscast. They are the voice of the television station. But what about station. reporters? I mean, that's, you're talking about big deal anchor people. Yeah, I'm talking about but big deal anchor. But there's still a major issue about whether a general assignment reporter in most it's, television stations can be out. It's because uh, broadcast management is conservative because there are so many fewer people who are on air versus people who write stories for publications. And there's also the whole thing about being in someone's living room. It's a, it's a you know, I was told in graduate school, I remember a professor said, people call television a mass medium. It's not. It's an intimate medium. People experience you in their bedroom or living room or kitchen when they're alone. You remind me by saying that. We have seen gay characters and gay subplots and gay issues on primetime television, morning television, talk shows. It's bizarre, isn't it, that news yeah. is what is behind the curve when the rest of popular culture, music, movies, I mean, yeah. you name it, there, there's gay all over the place. And for some reason, the, the news industry, They're which is just supposed to is more conservative and more unwilling. And, and the pitch has to be harder than in 
the rest Every, of what people are watching. Everybody said to me when I left news in New York and went to Entertainment Tonight in Los Angeles, oh, watch out, those, those Hollywood people, they're so closeted. You know what? They're far more liberal and tolerant than anything I see in the newsroom. In the newsroom, it's, I don't know if we want to do that story. That's not our 4 o'clock audience. You know, those are older women. We better not mention the G word in the 4 o'clock show. Maybe at 11. Ask the 11 o'clock producer. And you know what's bizarre about that? What do you think the people watching the 4 o'clock news have been watching from noon to 4? They've what? been watching Donahue <laughs> talk to transvestites. Yeah, so it's I mean, ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. It's totally true. For all the discussion, one group has already drawn its own conclusions about openly gay reporters and increased coverage of gay issues, the conservative right. In one of these articles, I think, by Cal Thomas, he talks about gay journalists being apologists for homosexuality. And I don't see us as apologists by any means. I believe that we are explainers, if you will, of homosexuality. And the need to explain who we are is a result of fear, hatred, um, and ignorance about homosexuality. We're not talking about advocacy. We're not talking about taking a political lobbying position. What we're saying is do better journalism. Do more accurate journalism. Be fair. At the Asbury Park Press, at least, we're making some incremental changes in how we cover the community. We try to give our readers a very realistic picture of gay life throughout the entire spectrum. Gays and lesbians are not only in the news, they are now a permanent part of the newsroom. In my newspaper, my editor came up to me and said, uh, we're covering too much gay stuff. I want you to stop writing gay stuff in your column, which I do quite frequently. I can't imagine that happening because he knows I deck him. Hi, I'm Marga Gomez, and you're watching In the Life, or as we say, En la Vida. Still to come on In the Life. The Mautner Project, an organization whose mission is education and direct service for lesbians with cancer, and performance artists Susan Miller and Michael Kearns, whose work is informed by their experience with two different life-threatening illnesses. But first... In the Life gives a warm welcome back to lesbian comic Kate Clinton, who hosted the first several episodes of this program back in 1992. Kate Clinton began giving her comic take on current events in 1981, the start of the Reagan era, which was about the same time that Representative Barney Frank began offering his take on current events as a new member of the U.S. House of Representatives. We thought it'd be fun to ask Kate to talk to Barney and his lover of eight years, Herb Moses, about the politics and protocol of being a gay power couple in the nation's capital. I'm in the office where Barney Frank works as representative of the fourth district of my home state, Massachusetts. In 1987, Barney came out as an openly gay man, and I couldn't be any happier. He couldn't be happier either, apparently, because a couple of months later, he met and fell in love with Herb Moses. They now share a townhouse and their lives here in Washington. When Barney's not here at work, that is. Mm-hmm. Frank Bill's been great for us. Don't, don't let them change it. Hang on a second. Yeah. What things do you think is you've paid a cost for because you're out? Very little. And, and a lot of ways, I think it's even helped politically, because I honestly believe that a lot of people, both in the general electorate and among my colleagues, admire honesty. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, a benefit. And I think the answer is it hasn't made any difference. I but there, I mean, there, there was this effort when, clearly it was in the back of Dick Armey's mind when he referred to me as Barney Fagg. And, and, uh, and he said that he was trying to say, Frank and harangue. Yes. And now, I've worked on that. <laughs> right. It might have been Frank. Frank or... or... Well, I, I thought Kate, the best response to that came, uh, uh, my brother asked my mother, uh, because he said he just mispronounced Frank, and it was an innocent <laughs> mispronunciation of Frank to come out as fag. And so my mother uh, acknowledged that, yes, uh, she became Mrs. Frank uh, 59 years before that. And she said, in the 59 years, no one had ever introduced her as Elsie Fag. <laughs> so, she was disinclined to believe that that was a simple mispronunciation. And the general public said, please, will you pay attention to the real things? And, you know, th this is not anything that we care about. You know, the benefits have been enormous, not just the, mm. the personal benefits, but I wouldn't have met Herb if uh, I'd come out if I had. I think, you know, Herb has enough sense not to want to live a kind of uh, 
half-life with someone who was in the closet. We're on the office tour of Washington, D.C., and now we're at the office of Herb Moses. We'll let Herb tell you what he does. I am director of housing initiatives at Fannie Mae. My job is to create new types of mortgage products for parts of the home finance market that are not ordinarily served. I understand you have a wonderful new domestic partnership. Yes, we, we've had it for about two years. And I think it's the, the best or one of the best in the country. This is incredible stuff. I noticed it as soon as I came in. I feel like Martha Stewart right now. But did you make this? Of course. Um, oh. all, the, all the pottery is mine. It's, uh, it's what I do in the, the rest of my time. Um, this, this one is actually a, a, bury, a prototype of a burial urn. And where is this? place you work. It's not here. No, it's, uh, yes, here in the, <laughs> in the office. It's, no, it's in the house. So, Herb, how did you get your start doing this? Well, I, I kind of taught myself how when I was in junior high, but um, when I was in high school, I, I think my ceramics teacher was gay, and I had ceramics alternating with Jim, and he used to <laughs> sort of let me hang out in the ceramics room and cut Jim, and, and so, and I, I he, he was just real nice about it. I'm sure he, he like, knew, but uh, no idea what happened to him. But, mm. uh, I just kind of stuck with it and got to be good. What mm -hmm. most interested us about Barney and Herb was their life together here on S Street. We live in a nice typical sort of urban neighborhood, uh, <laughs> especially for gay men. And there are only three Starbucks within walking distance, oh. so. So do you eat out a lot? Well, it depends. I mean, we don't cook a whole lot. It's rarely cooking from scratch. I mean, we're both working. We generally don't get home. In fact, you know, we're usually sometimes one's home by seven, the other at nine, or vice mm -hmm. versa. I've got the legislative schedule. Although, I have one sort of advantage, disadvantage, as Herb has noted. If I say I'm working late and that's why I won't be home, he can turn on C-SPAN and check up on me. So, <laughs> How did you meet? I wrote him a note. I congratulated him on coming out. And yeah, said, it was just after I had come out. In June of 87, I decided to just get it over with and, and announce publicly that I was gay. I mean, I just said, well, hey, if you ever want to get together for a cup of coffee, I'd like to meet you. You know, I, I, just, I couldn't believe I got a call from him. You know, let's be honest, one of the reasons they came out was to meet guys. <laughs> you know, I've, your social life is kind of cramped when you're sort of closeted. So I figured, well, okay, so we did. So what did you do? You called your family and said, I'm dating the cutest congressman. <laughs> well, not right away. I, I, at some point I did tell my parents, that, I said, well, you know, I, I did land the most eligible bachelor in gay America. And I, I don't think they really thought of it in those terms. <laughs> they hadn't really thought about what would come next after being gay. I don't think, you know, being gay and dating the congressman was anything that had even occurred to them, nor had it occurred to me. Now, when you're at functions, how do you introduce each other? I, I always, almost always say lover because I just want people to be clear about it. Although, my diction isn't great, so um, I will say lover and some people will hear brother. <laughs> say, oh, well, you don't look that much alike. Right, I mean, it, some people just don't hear it because they're not expecting to hear it. Or if, I mean, if you say partner in certain circumstances, I mean, you got like two guys standing there in suits and they think that you're partners in business or something like that. Now, are you invited to spousal events? Yes, I am a member of the Democratic Spouses Forum. It's fine. It's, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that they have me there. What is the wildest reaction you ever got? Well, I think it's, for her, when we, we were to the Democratic Convention in Atlanta, and he had full spousal privileges like any other member of Congress. Um, I remember Jim Wright was then the speaker, and he said, well, we're going to have uh, credentials for the spouses. And uh, I raised my hand, I was at the Democratic caucus, and I said, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the spouses include, uh, you know, sort of significant others? And he stopped me and he said, yeah, but I'd advise one at a time. <laughs> so, but so her has ever since then been fully credentialed like any any other spouse. But he got there before me because we were coming from from different towns, and 
apparently, uh, you said when you checked in to a room which had one king size bed, the clerk assumed he was my personal Secret Service agent. The Secret Service was staying at the hotel where we were at, or some of them were, and they thought I was another Secret Service agent too. It was a little flattering, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure what they thought that he needed Secret Service man in his room for. But now I understand that you have been able to move. Jesse Helms around a room with a simple gesture. Uh, yes, it's true. Actually, mm -hmm. we were at White House picnic. Gary Studd's lover, Dean, or Gary came over and said, you guys wouldn't believe who I'm sitting with, Jesse Helms. He says, you got to come over. So I came over and sat down, and I was talking with Gary. And then and Jesse Helms and his wife were across at the other side of the table. and. Barney came over and he kind of did, you know, he just did, you know, very, very innocent gesture, but Helms looked at it and got up and walked away. Actually, I, if I thought that worked, I guess Herbert and I would be willing to, <laughs> we'd be willing to travel the country and I would yeah. rub him and make Jesse go away. I think yeah. Now, what is it like when... Before Kay Clinton left that day, she had to do one more thing for Barney and Herb. Give them another photo with another Clinton. Throughout the 80s, gays and lesbians mobilized around the AIDS crisis, forever changing the way we look at health care. At the same time, the lesbian community was confronting still another disease, breast cancer, an illness which was, and some would argue still is, receiving almost no public attention. And as late as 1989, there were virtually no health services educating the community or addressing lesbian needs. One woman, Mary Helen Mautner, in the final weeks of her own battle with breast cancer, was inspired to change that. It was her life partner who carried out that dream. Mary Helen was um, diagnosed with a recurrence of breast cancer in um, the spring of 86. And she was in treatment solidly for three years. And in the summer of 89, uh, was in the hospital and was having a bone scan. And I left the hospital to go get our daughter from school and bring her to visit. And then when I came back, she had with me the only conversation we ever had about the project. Um, because at that point, she was really quite sick. But she had made a page of notes. And basically, what she had written down was um, services for people with AIDS. And she had listed them. You know, there's legal, there's food, there's visitation, there's the buddy system. And then she put service for lesbians with cancer and in her own way. Her language, she put zip. Um, you know, there's nothing. And she said, you know, we really have to look at the model that's been put before us through the AIDS movement, and we really have to make sure that every lesbian, um, you know, has somebody standing outside in the hallway. In 1990, the Mautner Center opened its doors, becoming the first program of its kind to offer services to lesbians with cancer and its operations would not be possible without the commitment of its volunteers. The direct services volunteers participate uh, in any activity a family would do. For instance, a lesbian may need someone to help her prepare meals or to provide her transportation to and from her doctor's appointments. Um, just about anything that a family would need to you know, operate day to day. Um, we're able to provide them volunteers so, so that they, you know, can have some relief. In addition to providing these services, the Mautner Project has helped found several organizations, including the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Together they bring the demands of lesbians with breast cancer to the federal government and the Centers for Disease Control. Through our work in the last year and a half, we now have the lesbians are designated a priority population in the breast and cervical cancer program, screening program, um, which is, to my way of thinking, it's tremendous because it means that every public health department in the country has a mandate to think about. They don't have a mandate to include us, but they have a mandate to think about how they can reach the lesbian population in their service area. In 1993, Dr. Susan Haynes published a study which estimated that one in three lesbians face a lifetime risk of breast cancer. Although this statistic has been challenged, the factors that contribute to this risk have not. 
There's some evidence that suggests that lesbians are at higher risk for breast and cervical cancer. We need more data, of course, but essentially the issue is that lesbians may not have children um, or may delay childbearing past the age of 30, and that in itself is a risk factor. Um, there may be some um, drinking and smoking issues to look at in terms of increased risk, but to me the most important is that lesbians don't need to go to a doctor for birth control every year, which means they often skip their yearly reproductive appointment that they should have, don't get the pap test that they need, and don't get the chance to have a clinical breast exam that might catch a lump. The other reason we don't go is fear, fear of having to come out in the doctor's office. You go to the gynecologist and the first thing they say is, are you using birth control? The lesbian says no. Second question is, are you sexually active? The answer is yes. Third question is, are you stupid? You know, no, you're not stupid, you don't need it. And you're forced into this position of having to come out. Um, and for a lot of people, that's, a, that's very risky. Um, people still lose their jobs, which people don't believe lose their jobs from having come out in the doctor's office because you don't know who works there, you're in a small community. And there has been some data to suggest that doctors, gynecologists and family practice physicians don't want to treat lesbians. Um, there's some studies that show that. You also have the economic issues that lesbians um, may be, as women, certainly underemployed and underinsured to begin with, and then of course don't have access to be on their partner's health insurance plans. So I believe there's underinsurance of lesbians. People ask me, why a special project for lesbians? You know, why can't lesbians just be out there, like all women, getting their cancer treatment and their cancer services from mainstream organizations? And for me, the answer is really simple, and that is that lesbians are not treated in the culture like all other women, and we know that. The Mautner Center has inspired similar programs throughout the country, giving voice and visibility to an issue once largely ignored. Artist Susan Miller, herself a breast cancer survivor, further exposes the personal issues surrounding this illness on a different platform, the stage. In her Obie award-winning play, My Left Breast, mastectomy becomes a metaphor for loss and, more importantly, life. I never thought to write about breast cancer until it became a metaphor for me. Um, there was another uh, loss in my life, and that somehow tapped into, I mean, all kinds of f former losses. And then it became a metaphor for transformation. I miss it, but it's not the roof over my head. It's not a word I need or a sentence I can't live without. I miss it, but it's not a conversation with my son. It's not my courage or my lack of faith. I see the play not about a series of losses, but about a series of, 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 of connections and opportunities. This is my body, where the past and the future collide. This is my body, all at once timely, all at once chic. My deviations, my battle scars, my idiosyncratic response to the physical realm the past deprivation, and the future howl. I am a one-breasted, menopausal, Jewish, bisexual, lesbian mom, and I am the topic of our times. Having had breast cancer put me in the world in a new way. I felt a vulnerability. Um, losing a lover and, and turning 50, uh, it, it was as if I was uh, a babe, uh, not a not a babe, but a baby, um, you know, new, speaking, uh, learning to speak again, uh, being single. It was in one of these rooms she asked me to make love to her. Her father had just died and she needed this from me. I knew how to marry love with death. I knew if you kissed someone who needed you to live, you would live. What's most um, encouraging for me is, is that there's a, a universality here. I mean, it's very specific, it's, it's my story, but oddly enough, the, the sort of more specific it is, the more people seem to find a place for themselves in it. Another performer who has taken his own experience of living with a life-threatening illness to the stage is Michael Kearns. In his play, Intimacies, Kearns portrays dozens of culturally diverse people with AIDS, revealing a disease which affects all indiscriminately. I first performed Intimacies in 1989, and I had done, up until that period of time, as, as shocking as that seems in retrospect, many, many plays which were called AIDS plays. 
All of them, for one reason or another, seem to depict the story of the gay white male. I grew just simply as an artist tired of it, and I went to the drawing boards and decided to create characters for myself who I felt were disenfranchised, were not being depicted in the media, were not sexy enough to be in People magazine or on the daytime talk shows. My hair has been my calling card. That's my nickname, Big Red, named after my hair. Big Red is one of those characters, and I actually was doing a piece in San Francisco, and I would come back and forth to the hotel, and there were uh, numerous uh, African-American hookers on the street corners, and cars would drive by, and they'd scream, hey, baby, you got AIDS, and, and I mean, it was just this humiliating, demeaning uh, treatment of these women who were really trying to make a living. And I just looked at them and I thought, what would that be it like to be her? What would it be like to have AIDS and be out you know, there on that street? That disease is in her. It's just another time. My other character, Neil, happens to be a gay white male, um, one of the few that I do. Sammy was Ethel to my Lucy. You know, I try to grab the audience and I try to make them laugh and also let them see that one of the things that the gay white male community hasn't done is lost its sense of humor. We became inseparable, resuming our Lucy and Ethel roles, acting out with a vengeance, turning our lives into Lucy episodes. Lucy and Ethel go to the baths. My agenda is to entertain, but my agenda also is to make people think and make, make people empathize with the pain and the horror of this disease. You know, if somebody asked me when this was all over, whether I live five more years or five more months, what did you do in the war, Daddy? I would say I wrote AIDS monologues. That's what I did in the war. As the current political season winds its way towards November, the story of one openly gay politician, a mayor from a small Midwestern town, was a segment that we showed you last summer, and one which we couldn't resist showing you once more, especially since that mayor, Gene Ulrich, is now running for a seat in the Missouri State House of Representatives. I grew up in Cooper County, uh, pretty much. I come here when I was six, been here all the rest of my life. Never left except for Vietnam. I would describe Bunsen as a very small farming community in the center of the heart of Missouri. I knew I was gay probably at the age of 12. Well, it was pretty rough because it was, everybody was very closeted about it and I thought, actually I thought I was the only one. So. I met Larry through The Advocate. I put an ad in The Advocate, and uh, we met on uh, Labor Day weekend, and I knew right then I was in love, and I wanted him with me the rest of my life, so he moved in a month later, and we've been together 22 years. Everywhere we went, we were together. We never kissed in public or held hands, but we were together all the time, and people just accepted him. I'm sure there's people that definitely would disapprove of my lifestyle, but as a whole, they know me and accept me for who I am and what I've done for the community. I ran for mayor in the beginning because there were things in this town that weren't getting done. I wanted senior housing. I wanted a good fire department. I'm in my eighth term now, which is over 15 years of mayorship in the community here. I have to work elsewhere for a living. Bunston pays me $3 a year as mayor. When I get 20 years in, I think that's enough. Well, it would be 10 terms. I think somebody else should do it for a while then. Um, you're known as the, the mayor with his hand out. Is that true? I think down in Jeff City, they, they refer to me as the mayor with his hand out because I'm always down there for grants and, and any monies that are available. So, as, in, as a small town with a lot of minorities and uh, low income and elderly, we qualify. So I pursue it. <laughs> right. The first thing I applied for was a housing rehab grant on the south side of 268000 um, then we applied for another well. I got 10,000 or 58,000 for that, and I got 10,000 for a park, $350,000 for a sewer and lagoon system, and the latest is another housing rehab on the north side of town of 211,000, which puts it over a million dollars. 
the caboose has been my latest project. Since our town was founded on the railroad, the railroad was actually here before the town, I thought that would be an important piece of history to have, so I pursued that, and Union Pacific saw fit to donate us a caboose, and we got it and got it painted, and we're working now to finish the inside and make a museum out of it. I don't see myself as a role model at all, but I think the gay community does see me that way. They think I'm important, I don't. I think I'm just a human being like everybody else and trying to do what's right for my community. I do things totally different, I'm sure, than, than most in the gay community. I believe that you can kill people with kindness. I would like to see the gay community reach out and build a bridge between themselves and the straight community because we all have to be together. We have to live together, we have to work together, and we have to form a community together. Like Jean Ulrich, gays and lesbians everywhere, from small towns to major cities, in Congress and on the campaign trail, are working hard to make their voices heard. From all of us in the life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Lily Achenkloss, the Gill Foundation, James C. Hormel, Eldon W. Tamblin, Olive Watson, and In the Life's National Membership Network.